from wherever and however you are joining us today. This is also being live streamed on YouTube right now. So I wanna thank all of you all for making space to be here with us today. Um, I am Dr. Tanisha Singleton. I am the president on the board of directors for Black Girl Hockey Club. If this is your first touch point with us or your first digital event with us, or maybe it's your 10th, welcome. And to refresh and offer some context for everything, you know, Black Girl Hockey Club focuses on making hockey more inclusive and welcoming for Black women, our families, our friends, and those that love us. Everything we do is in the vision to facilitate and promote intersectional equality in hockey. And we know that means on the ice, but we also need to recognize that that means off of it as well. One of the things kind of like a mantra, I'd say that as president of the board that I've been trying to reinforce is this notion of controlling what you can control. So what does that mean, right? To me, it means that I know there's a lot of toxicity. There's a lot of ill vibes. There's a lot of criminal behavior and just all around disruptive energy that's going on outside, right? And as much as many of us as individuals, we want to go out and we want to change the world. That's a very, very hard pill, right? Uh, I have several students and colleagues that I work with that say really romantic things like, oh, my God, I'm going to end racism. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, I'm going to dismantle corruption. It's like, really? Could forward me that calendar invite? I would like to go. When is, you know, send me the event bright so I can grab that ticket, too. As if no one has ever wanted or dreamed or attempted and have died trying to do these things before, right? Of course, we all want to have a positive world full of social good, but the, the sad truth is not everybody can be dope. Not everybody is good. So what can we do? We can identify where we can contribute, audit what privilege we do have, recognize where you have access and what you have access to that can be shared for others. That's what we're doing here in Black Girl Hockey Club. And in the process, making space for quality ex experiences for everyone. Not waiting around for someone to give us permission for these things. We've made and are strengthening a community for Black folks in and around hockey. And with that, with that growth, we're now giving it back to the communities that we come from because we all need support. It takes a village. So you control what you control by matching values with action. We value inclusion and accessibility. So you know what? We've got our scholarship program that we give out three times a year to offset some of the financial costs and offer recognition to the young black girls and youth that lace up the skates. We value opportunity and representation. So you know what? We launched a leadership development program to provide meaningful mentorships for black professionals of any gender identity to learn new skills and sharpen their existing ones in all areas of hockey. That's marketing, journalism, color commentary, broadcasting, refing, executive leadership, all of these things. Community, passion, and safe spaces. We value these things. So you know what? We have meetups, book clubs, self-care events. We're continually putting out these types of things. And we value education and lifelong learning, which is being demonstrated in activities like this, in this digital event that is serviced around our Get Uncomfortable campaign. It's been a little over a year since the Get Uncomfortable campaign has launched. And we're offering that pledge that everyone can take as a commitment to disrupt racism on and off the ice. A strong over 7,000 have taken the pledge. And over the last year since the launch, we've took on a general kind of universal approach in emphasizing that this isn't and should not be left just for black people to create a solution for. We've been uncomfortable. So this is an everyone issue and non-people of color specifically to roll up their sleeves and do the work. It's okay to not know, but what is not okay is the choice to remain ignorant. The theme of our Get Uncomfortable campaign for this year is the workplace. And it's been a hard couple of weeks to be a hockey fan right now. We all know this, we all feel this, we all see this. We all know this, the amount of racism, victim shaming, victim blaming, it fills me with what I can only describe as the sad rage. And it starts from within. 
within organizational development. What you stand for spews out and influences the fan experience too. And right now it sucks. There's no other word. It has for a long time. So what we're here today for is to discuss what getting uncomfortable in the worst place looks like, what it feels like, and offer some insight so hopefully you can find it useful and begin controlling what you can control. And maybe if each of us start to plant these types of seeds of positivity and spreading dope experiences for one another, maybe one day we can be louder than the bad guys so they won't matter as much. But I've rambled enough and this isn't my show. So let me introduce you to the moderator of this event and I'll have our moderator come to the digital stage, my vitamin bloop soul sister, Erica Ayala. What? it do how are you doctor the doctor tanisha <laughs> singleton i am well thank you so much and uh forgive my echo uh i am in tulsa oklahoma once again we, i was here for juneteenth but now i will be here for a little bit uh yes. so uh you know um in my head i'm saying i just got my new assignment mm -hmm. but uh th th there's not much in here so so we got to deal with the echo but uh <laughs> i love i love how you kick this off and um, just a few things that I want to add. I, I love that you also talked about where we are right now in hockey. And there are some amazing things, uh, which we'll get into a new team, um, back to what a lot of people consider their traditional hockey um, engagement and experience. But unfortunately, that also comes with some things that we have to deal with and get uncomfortable is the theme for a reason. And so we hope to, as a community, be up, up front and yeah. forthright with, with what's happening and to, to reflect. But what I do want to say is just to step out of the hockey community for a moment. And we were talking off of line and I, some of y'all know, I, I geek out a little when it comes to human resources and leadership development, because things um, are so important and uh, setting the foundation is extremely important. And some of the things in my education, Dr. Singleton, that I'm sure you will appreciate is that we were always told things like what gets measured gets improved. Hmm. What gets measured gets improved. And I thought about that a lot as we were getting ready for this theme for Get Uncomfortable in the Workplace. Mm -hmm. And I, I was sharing the story that I went to a professional graduate program that was creating leaders in the public and nonprofit space. But when we, when I sought out conversations to talk about how racism or, um, you know, even some of the laws and practices that we have impact the work that we do, I either had to take those on as electives, if I could take those conversations on as a professional at all. Right. So what gets measured gets improved. Um, so that's where I am, Dr. Singleton. Yeah, what like, gets what's measured gets out? improved. Yes. yes, exactly. What's left out? Who's left out? And yes, it's those metrics of success that everyone wants to have, like all the C-level folks, right? They always want, okay, well, what these are, this is how we will define success here. Well, who's at the table to even help determine that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's Absolutely. If you yeah, are an echo chamber, then how the hell is that progression? Yes. And it reminds me of the one of the latest Grey's Anatomy episodes that I saw. So no, do not spoil. I was on the road. I did not watch on Thursday, but um, I haven't watched it 10 years. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the truth is, though, like it was one of my COVID binges I hadn't watched before. Mm. Anyway, that's a that's for another another uh, live stream. But um, the reason I brought up Grey's Anatomy is because on that show recently they tackled um, the uh, it was uh, getting on a transplant plant list and that the criteria for the transplant plant list made it difficult for certain patients to be able to be eligible. And they were working on outdated, antiquated information. So I love that you brought that up. You know, I like to slide in a pop culture reference or two, but these, you know, these come from, and the New York Times actually had a great article that came out around the time that that episode aired. So going back to what gets measured gets improved, but also when you talk about who is being essentially omitted or is yeah. an afterthought when we 
expect the system to work a certain way so that we have criteria, but those systems were created when X, Y, Z wasn't even considered right. at best, you know, yeah. uh, like, yeah, where, is there a, uh, you know, a uh, review process, how the, the lack thereof probably, which is why there are so many outdated, you know, things going on in here. So, yeah, I love that you, you brought that up, the, you know, success, because that's, that's huge. And we're talking about all levels of the workplace and in, in every industry, you know, this isn't um, a copy and paste world, but there are so much basic things that, People, I didn't know that. I don't, and that's fine. It's like I said, it's like, it's okay to not know what's not is to stay ignorant is to remain, right. not to have resources and things to go to ask. I need help, but it's such an ego thing. That's the psychology of it, right? If we admit that we don't know something that, oh, uh, if you need assistance with something, like we need to humble ourselves and recognize Correct. that as things continually evolve, so does our knowledge base. And so naturally we're not gonna come out the gate knowing everything. So, and those mm -hmm. are just such, such rich and important things. So thank you. I'm gonna hand it off over to you and get this show started. And I will be monitoring the chat. You know, this is being live streamed as well. So you can put questions there. Also, if you're an attendee here in our Zoom webinar, you can use the Q&A function. I will be monitoring that. And we will have some time for Q&A towards the end of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to, before we bring on our fantastic panelists, just remind everyone, if you are watching with us and you um, registered through Eventbrite, you should have access to some of the resources that we're going to be talking about, including uh, the program updates. We asked each of our panelists, as we always do with our Black Girl Hockey Club Get Uncomfortable events and all of the events, we have some um, prepackaged questions that we sent out to all of the panelists so they could reflect and give their thoughts. So we have all of that available for you uh, if you've registered for Eventbrite and we should also get that via email. And as you might have noticed, I'm already scribbling down some notes. We hope that you are doing the same. Write down your questions, write down your frustrations or you know your pain points. We really want this to truly be a conversation. And so feedback is always appreciated. And that is what the chat is for. But um, I, I, I'm under uh, the impression and the understanding that there's some pretty, uh, pretty good uh, sports games on today. So we're going to keep the party rolling, whether it's football, uh, hockey a little bit later. I know I'll be getting into some hockey or, uh, you know, UFC, whatever we got. Uh, we're going to keep it on track. But remember, this is an extremely important conversation. So we do hope that you stay present with us for now. But first up, we're going to bring up Becca Elliott. Let's go. And I got to, you know, I'm going to try to do do my moderator thing. But Becca, we might have to connect on some Seattle Kraken stuff a little bit later. But uh, you serve... Um, as the director of digital and fan experience for the Seattle Kraken, which of course also includes the brand new mobile app. Um, and I think for anyone who hasn't seen the app, it's definitely an innovative way. That's also kind of following the trend of how we engage in sports right now. Um, and that's essentially what you and your team do. So Becca, welcome. Thank you for joining us here for Get Uncomfortable in the Workplace. Uh, so we'll start with this. We'll, you know, just tee it up for you right here. Um, Becca, when did you first fall in love with hockey? So fun story. I'm, uh, I'm originally from the South, um, grew up where the Thrashers were playing, went to a lot of Thrashers games going, growing up, which is fun, um, and then moved to Virginia. Uh, so then really grew up a Caps fan. Um, so sorry, Renee, with our Penguins Caps thing, you know. Um, <laughs> and to be honest, it was Ovi, right? Like there's nothing a 11, 10 year old kid uh, watching him play when he first came into the league that couldn't really help create magic. Um, and I grew up a lacrosse player, another sport that's a little bit sort of limited in its access, but um, really felt similar in a lot of its energies to hockey. And a lot of those parallels felt uh, like they were there in sports that I understood and, and played heavily. And I'm the oldest of six. We all were lacrosse players, um, all my brothers. Uh, and I think four of us will play in college uh, throughout the, the years. We've got one more left. We'll see. Um, but for me, hockey, especially as a live sport, we all know there is nothing more engaging than, than live hockey. And I went to an SEC school, so that's saying something if I put that over college football. Um, <laughs> and going to Caps games, especially now in Capital One Arena, um, really 
for me, created that experience that I care so much about of connection with humans around you, you don't know, you've never met before. And hockey is such an intimate, intense, high speed experience that for me, um, you know, that love started probably really middle school uh, after I moved up to Virginia and got got the caps uh, around. And now now I've got another team, my new number one uh, out here in Seattle. Fantastic. Well, Becca, thank you so much for walking us mm-hmm. through that. Always nice to chat with a um, uh, fellow athlete that has found their way to hockey uh, by just experiencing it. I, I came a, a little later to the game, um, but now you can't get rid of me. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm sorry or you're welcome is, is uh, appropriate, maybe both, but, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's something though that you said about your experience that I think kind of translates to what you're doing now at the Seattle Kraken. And again, using technology to find ways to engage. You also are coming from the Seattle Kraken that uh, was, you know, being released as we like to say a lot in, in a time where things were very different <laughs> for the hockey community, for the entire world. So when you think about your experiences that you just reflected on and, you know, having that one player, that you really were getting behind. Um, and then think about how the Seattle Kraken team had to figure out a way to do that when we weren't going to arenas, uh, let alone you didn't even have players for <laughs> people to get behind. But what were some of the, th- the things that you were able to do um, and what conversations did you have regarding trying to get that interaction um, even before you had players and certainly while we were still dealing with COVID? Yeah, so it was a fascinating thing. I mean, I haven't launched a sports franchise before. It doesn't happen very often sort of in the universe. New sports franchises don't come by all the time. Um, Certainly a really interesting three years to be doing it. I joined the team about just over three years ago now. And we went from about 30 people to about 200 during the COVID year, which is a pretty unbelievable thing to be doing from a hiring perspective, uh, logistically, just even from a community building standpoint within your employees. Um, I will say, and I'm sure we'll talk about him, our leader in Todd Lightwicky, our CEO is an absolutely magical human being. I'm not overselling him. Um, and so the, the leadership and the inspiration there But I think for us from a city and a community and a regional perspective, the hockey community going through the, uh, I would say overhaul that it's, that it's going through and really sports as a whole uh, could not have been better understood by the region. Seattle is a region of activists, of people who are uh, very socially and politically aware, uh, which is really fun uh, to live here and, and be part of that. And as a team, it became pretty evident to us almost immediately that we wanted to be representative of our community as a whole, Um, which meant making a lot of decisions that didn't necessarily feel safe and were never the, this is what we've always done in sports. Um, I often say that's my least favorite answer about why we're doing something. And people know if they're in a meeting with me, if they say, this is how we've always done it, I'm probably going to freak out. Um, I've been around for three years now, so they know. that, that it could be the right thing to do, but just because it's always the way you've done it doesn't mean that that's the reason to do it. Um, and so for us, and, and we can sort of go down any path we want from here, um, but it was really just being willing to ask ourselves those questions as a whole to make sure that we were making uh, the right decisions for our community. I will say, I think our timing was incredibly lucky that we weren't playing our first game in the fall of 2020. Uh, the fact that we didn't go until 2021, that COVID year, we were able to staff up and and really have um, a, that year to establish who we wanted to be in our community when the community needed us most, um, really called upon us heavily to uh, make the right decisions uh, around uh, here in Seattle. So it's been a pretty wild year. We're all very tired, but for all the right reasons, uh, that's for sure. Yeah, I love that. And so obviously the event and the theme as Dr. Singleton and I were talking Mm -hmm. about earlier is not just get uncomfortable, but getting uncomfortable in the workplace. And so it sounds like they're just, like you said, building a franchise is certainly one way to get uncomfortable and to get uncomfortable quickly. (laughs) Um, But uh, again, in some of the the, 
uh, questions that we sent out, you gave some answers about uh, different hiring practices. And once we get the panel mm -hmm. together, I do want to have us bounce uh, off of each other when it comes to that. But I, I wanted to get back to the theme and to your experience with the yep. Seattle Kraken, because as you mentioned, there was a lot of hiring that happened in a relatively short period of time. And so I would imagine that for someone who's been with the franchise now for over three years, that th that was a pivot point, right? Yes. Um, and so a lot of times when we think about culture or we think about culture shifts, we think about uh, things that take time, years, usually big blocks of time, but it sounds like this is probably happening within, you know, maybe a year to a handful of months. So what was that experience like? And what were some of the ways that the organization prioritized getting uncomfortable while also um, kind of keeping that standard and that structure or as much of it as uh, was established early on? Yeah. So I'll try to make this as linear as possible. So it's easy to follow. Uh, and I think the, it starts with, with Todd. Um, and, and I'll, again, I can speak to him, um, but genuinely a visionary leader and anyone who has met him um, or is lucky enough to have met him knows what I'm talking about, but he is one of those people who makes everyone he is near feel heard, special, um, important, and he actually follows all of that up. It's not just magical charisma. It is, I'm here to help you in whatever you need. And I have a lot of resources, so just ask. Um, and so knowing him for a little over a year, um, when we did go work from home, um, that actually was something he walked by my desk before because Seattle obviously had the first COVID cases in the country. Um, and we were all still in the office and he walked by uh, cause we had made work from home optional. Um, and I had mentioned, Hey, I don't think that people are going to work from home until our leadership goes home. Uh, and he stopped by and he and I talked about it. And the next day we all were work from home. Um, he was like, good point. If the executives are all here, everyone's going to be here. And, um, then obviously we've been home for a long time. Um, so it's just sort of an example of a, of a moment that could be uncomfortable where the leader opened his door and made that easy for me, um, which then leads to, if I kind of keep going, when especially the protests began after George Floyd, as an organization, I was hoping we would say something because really a lot of that happened on a Sunday afternoon and we have our all staffs every Monday morning at 9 a.m. And I reached out and I said, I hope we're gonna talk about this. I think as an organization, we're all home, we're feeling very isolated, we're all very upset. Um, as an organization, I feel like we should talk about this. And there was already a plan. This was not my idea. I was just hoping that, that it was there. Um, but something that happened on that call is a few of our leaders were calling on, and we have an incredibly diverse staff, which is wonderful, but they were basically calling on our Black employees to speak about how they were feeling. And I know it was done with the best of intentions. And at the time, I was like, I understand that they feel like they're giving a space but what I'm afraid of is that we're asking our black employees to carry the emotional burden of this moment. Um, and because Todd and I have had lots of conversations, I went directly to him and I said, hi, um, just the thought that I don't think it's fair for our black employees to carry this moment and um, people reaching out to them, asking for books to read or help or all of that is again, all done with the best of intentions but this is unpaid labor for them. And this is a time that is incredibly more difficult for them than it is for you or me. And so can we as an organization do better um, than to lean on, on these employees? And out of that uh, came almost within a week, a, uh, our, what we now have is our DE&I committee and leadership team there um, where we started setting some of these conversations officially within the organization so that our, we're about 25% BIPOC, um, they weren't carrying the weight for the rest of the organization. And as we then scaled up and hired another you know, hundred people just within the next few months, we had established that foundationally as conversations that we were going to have as an organization on these calls. Um, and we were going to talk about them, but it was not going to be the job of just our black employees to come in and say, hey, we need to talk about George Floyd because that isn't fair and it isn't fair for them to have to then research and give a reading list to a bunch of people who suddenly have opened their eyes and care. Um, it was more us as an organization supporting everyone 
in, in all of these issues. Um, so a foundation set by a fantastic leader, difficult conversations were had and you know risky moments to go to your CEO and ask for things like that, but ones that are important. Um, and I think has led us to where we are now and sort of continuing to create a place that is hopefully as inclusive as we can be uh, now for both our, our staff and our fans. Wow, I really appreciate you offering that insight because mm-hmm. I'll be honest and you know, we can get into my affiliation um, <clears throat> or with the, the media side of the Kraken a little bit later, but as someone who has very recently followed the team, I noticed that the, the Seattle Kraken, I mean, everything is new, right? So there's always yep. a scope and an, an eyes on Seattle, but people had noticed that things public facing are different than what a lot of people would say they're accustomed to in, in hockey. Yep. And so it's good to get a little bit of information as far as what that uh, exchange was like from your perspective, mm-hmm. Becca. So we really appreciate that. We are going to get back to um, some of the other insights that you offered to us. Again, if you registered via link uh, bright, you should be able to access that and we'll get it again via email. But Becca, we're going to now uh, shoot over from one of the newer franchises or the newest franchise in the National Hockey League to, shall we say, one of the more seasoned ones. But Becca, we're going to have you back shortly. But yeah, right now we're going to go over to Jennifer Reynolds, who is the Equity, Diversity and Inclusive Manager for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And Hello, also, is hi there. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. And similarly to uh, the conversation that we just had with Becca, Jennifer, I'd love to get started with what I like to call my brown sugar question. How did you fall in love with hockey? Sure. Um, so I grew up out West. I'm, I'm Canadian and I grew up in Calgary, Alberta. Um, 2004, the Calgary Flames, um, led by Jerome McGinley, made their quest for the cup. Um, I was in grade seven, 13 years old, didn't really know like how amazing it was for a Canadian team to be making it to the Stanley Cup finals. But as everyone knows, if your team is in any playoffs, let alone the finals, the the, the city just goes nuts there, the, the Red Sea of the Flames. So 2004, I definitely became a, a, um, a Flames fan. And carried that on and um, now I I live and work in Toronto here and work for the Maple Leafs Um, you know based upon my job I I most definitely support the Leafs as my Eastern Conference team but my first love will always be uh, the the Flames and and Jerome McGinley there. (laughs) Just just the slightest little pause there I heard (laughs) Jennifer uh, not to put you on the spot, but totally to put you on the spot. We're, we're all, we're getting uncomfortable here, folks. No, you um, never forget your, your first love as, as your team, right? Like there, it, you, it goes you deep. Can't. <laughs> you can't, I respect that Jerome again. I love that. Um, especially because, you know, I'm learning a little bit more about the Calgary flames, uh, because Jerome, obviously one of the captains and the Kraken now have a former flames captain there. So, uh, you know, learning a little bit more about that, but I love that again, we're talking about memories, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Memories that are created because of sports. And what I think is great about what Black Girl Hockey Club does, and especially what we will be doing this year with the Get Uncomfortable in the Workplace, is now we're taking it back a little. So we have the moments on the ice, uh, getting to the Stanley Cup final. But all of that, and Becca alluded to it, that comes from leadership. And that comes from the executive level. And so, you know, I'd love, Jen, to get a little bit more uh, or learn a little bit more, excuse me, about the role that you now occupy for the Toronto Maple Leafs in particular, one of the organizations that has signed the Get Uncomfortable Pledge. But when it comes to thinking about diversity, equity and inclusion and, and managing that for the Maple Leafs, I mean, um, just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, I'll take you on a a bit of a journey here over the past 18 months. So I've worked with MLSC for about three and a half years. Um, One of those years being working in equity, diversity and inclusion. I have a finance and strategy background and spent my first two and a half years working in finance at, at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. And 
as um, many folks, um, you know, can relate. Um, a lot of the community work was done on the side of our desks. It was because we had a passion for that. Um, I was one of the founding members of our LGBTQ employee resource group, and it was something I've always had a passion for. Um, with the murder of George Floyd, our company had an awakening. Um, we finally took that time to really listen to what our employees we're looking for what our fans and community were expecting of us. We're a leader. We're one of the largest sports franchises across North America, um, and we needed to do more. Um, so it was in summer 2020 that MLSE established its equity, diversity, and inclusion practice. We hired on a senior vice president, and I was still working in finance, but I said, hey, like this is something that I am passionate about. Um, I have the relationships, the, the trusted networks within our company, and I think that I can do good here. So it was about um, a, a year ago that I switched over um, within our organization and worked with our senior vice president to build out our strategic framework. Um, we started to hire on more folks to support the teams. Um, under MLSE, we have four professional sports teams, including the, the Toronto Raptors, as well as the Toronto Maple Leafs. And um, we got to work. Um, it's been an amazing, challenging journey over, over the past year. And we know that um, although we have accomplished a lot, there is still um, so much more work that, that can be done there. Um, but I feel quite fortunate to, to have this role and be in a position where I can advocate for those who, whose voices aren't necessarily heard. Mm. I, there's so much that you gave us and we definitely will circle back. Like I said, I'm taking my notes. I hope everyone at home <laughs> is too. They're over here. That was a blank page, but I'm, I am taking notes. But, uh, <laughs> so, but a few things that I picked up, um, you know, is that you are coming from an area in finance um, and you're working for an organization with the Maple Leafs and the, the greater uh, sports and entertainment organization, MLSE, um, that... I think they kind of carry this tag of traditionalism in the workspace, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, but then you mentioned something that, I, and I took a note here, um, I just called it an, an affinity group. Sometimes you see organizations that, whether it comes from the employees themselves or maybe from leadership, but there's opportunities to have certain groups, uh, whether it be an LGBTQ group or, you know, maybe like a uh, Calgary Flame Support Group within the mm -hmm. Toronto Maple Leafs organization. <laughs> Um, well, you know, jokes aside, it's just an opportunity to connect with your colleagues yeah. uh, where you have a, a little bit of a, of a connection there. Um, but so in thinking of uh, having a finance background in mm -hmm. thinking of the Toronto Maple Leafs being an organization that's been operating and, you know, the, the adage of old dog, new tricks is kind of coming into my head here. Um, what were some of the ways in which um, you were able to utilize and parlay that to your advantage? And where maybe there are some difficult things about trying to be nimble um, with an organization and, and with a specific branch and department of an organization that was a little bit, um, it took a little more work maybe to get to the end results that you hope for. Yeah, I think in tying in this theme of, of getting uncomfortable, and that's very much um, one of the tactics that we we work to to infuse. It's it's only really when you can take those moments to reflect upon what the status quo is, get uncomfortable that isn't working for everyone. It may have gotten us to where we are today with the Leafs over a hundred years as a franchise, um, but it's not going to propel our us forward and be the team and the company that our community needs us to be. So it was taking a look at what policies and practices, anything from hiring uh, to our fan code of conduct that have been written, but haven't been um, looked at with an inclusion lens for a very long time. Um, getting to talk one-on-one -on -one with leaders of all of our sports teams, um, having them be involved in writing of our open letter and statement that we've published. And we've made our um, EDI commitments public to our fans and community because we want them to hold us accountable. We published those in, in February of this year, and we're going to be looking for people to, to um, let us know 
are we fulfilling this? Yes, we can put out our own measurements, our own KPIs, but it's really what we owe back to our employees and our fans there. So with my background in, in finance and strategy, it still very much is a strategic framework that, that we're applying and being able to come about it from a foundational perspective as um, our, our overall goals in ed and practice, we want to be able to thread inclusion into every single business decision that's done. There's six of us across the organization. There's no way we can be involved in every single meeting and business business um, decision that happens, but we want to make sure that people are thinking in that inclusive way. So when we're not there to ask those questions, other people can work as, as our conduits there and they can be pushing that forward. So if in 10 years we can, you know, work ourselves out of even needing an ED&I department, then that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to build up other people and their inclusive capabilities so that everyone is working as, as an advocate for, for ED&I. Press the wrong button, but yes, I love, I love all of that. And another note that I took down here is essentially ubiquitous, right? Mm -hmm. um, or that this is something that lives, it breathes just uh, as much as some of the other things that we love in sports, whether it's the colors or the goal song or, you know, the captain and stuff like that. And I think both you and Becca have given us essentially this idea of um, when, when Becca was talking, I, I, I was hearing her voice and being like, oh, that's how we always did it. Why? Like, but in my head, that's like the energy that she was bringing to these meetings. And with you, it's just like, okay, like, hey, this is this is who we've been. Got it. Cool. How is that getting us to who we want to be? And I think both of those are so important. And we are going to continue to tackle this, especially when it comes to getting uncomfortable in the hockey space and in the workplace. So Jen, hang tight. We've got another panelist that we're going to bring up, and that's Rico Phillips. And Rico, you are going to bring a little bit of a different spin and perspective to hockey than our first two panelists, and would love to hear you weigh in on that. But you got to do the one thing that everyone else had to do. Rico, let us know, when did you fall in love with hockey? That is a great question. I, I have to think about this from time to time because – as a as an elementary school kid, I, we played floor hockey um, first of all in gym, and then you could do it um, ex, um, extracurricular after. So I liked the sport, but I hadn't really gotten to the ice hockey thing until I, I got into a very non traditional. I was a student trainer in high school. My goal was to be a firefighter since I was a little boy, and. I, um, in fact, I got a first aid CPR card when I was, oh, right around, oh, I think it was in eighth grade, yeah, and so when I got to high school, the head athletic trainer knew, found out they had these cards, and he asked me, did I want to, um, you know, work with them, and I was thinking, this is a great segue to what I really want to do is become a firefighter. Well, my sophomore year, um, I was fortunate enough to be, um, to get a chance to work with the hockey team, and it was kind of uh, crazy because I wasn't sure if what, what to expect, but the only thing I knew is that they got their teeth knocked out. So I said, like, this is going to be a great fit for me as a trainer. No, I didn't want anybody's teeth knocked out. But the thing of it is, is when you're a trainer, you want to do your part. And, and I thought this is going to be a great sport for me to be a part of. So I didn't know how great it was going to be, though, to be honest with you, Erica, until my, my first game at ice level. And I seen the, the speed and skill and camaraderie of the players and the pure passion of the whole environment. And I was sucked right in. And I said, I want to learn how to skate. And so I asked our coach, I said, if I get some skates, can I learn how to skate with the team? And <laughs> we had a really good hockey team. And he looked at me sideways like, uh, I don't know if that's safe. And I said, well, I got to be here anyway. And then the, the assistant coach said, I'll teach him how to skate. So during the 10 minute warm up, um, the assistant coach took me down to at the one end and taught me all the mechanics and, uh, as they say, the rest is history. Wow. And you were a student athletic trainer. That's something that you've been doing essentially for uh, the last 30 years or so, which then, you know, and you've had opportunities, as you said, you, you learned how to, how to skate. I love that. Um, and you were able to really continue to grow your passion 
before the game and experiences within the game, which leads, of course, to what you're doing now as the director of diversity and inclusion for the Ontario Hockey League, the OHL, um, which is fantastic. Uh, I also chuckled a little bit when you told me that uh, the excitement and the draw was was knowing that you get to deal with as an athletic trainer uh, teeth coming out. I, first time I heard that one, but I I, I, I respect it. <laughs> hey, well, let me tell you this: it didn't go uh, well for me because when I did start playing hockey, these two front teeth are not mine. <laughs> so wow. Okay, I so came you back like, on myself. <laughs> you properly lived the hockey life. Then. Yes, I have. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> wow. Wow, that is very interesting. Um, okay, so there's a question that we got in the. Q&A. And just as a reminder, anyone that's listening in with us, please type in your questions as we're able. We'll get back to that. And it was for Becca and Jen, but um, it gets to essentially what is locker room culture. And for a lot of people, locker room culture is not the most positive thing in hockey. Now I can say as a former athlete, there definitely is a locker room culture and it can get a little bit, uh, quite literally, it can get funky. I mean, I thought the locker rooms I had been in as like a basketball player were funky, but like hockey and football equipment, just like, it just keeps that funk in there a little bit different. Um, (laughs) But that's not what the question is asking. The question is more alluding to, you know, some of what we're seeing, unfortunately now pop up as far as the culture of hockey and and how much of that permeates in the locker room. So let me just ask this um, in, in your time, because you've been able to be in the hockey space for a while now, what were some of the things that were a a part of that locker room culture um, that now reflecting um, maybe have changed over, over the years, if at all? Uh, that's an excellent, I mean, and all your questions are excellent, Erica. But the reason I say that, because I have actual experience. Uh, when I first began the sport, as I told you, I was a youngster in high school. My senior year, I became a referee. That's why I have a jersey up on the wall, whatever side it is. Um, but I've been refereeing for a long, long time. Well, when I started, though, it was an anomaly to have a person of color referee or even be a part of the sport, let alone referee the sport, be the authoritative figure. Um, and I couldn't stop yet. So that was a double whammy on me. Within my first uh, couple months as a referee in 1986, so I'm going to give you the time frame in life, um, I had a coach get upset with me over a call that I blew. And when I went over to try to describe what happened, his assistant coach came down the end of the bench and just went, went off on me. And he called me the N-word and told me he was going to kick my tail in the parking lot. And here I was, 17 years old, looking at a grown man's looking at me and uh, it was totally intimidating. I'd never been called that name like that by anybody. And I remember going to the locker room uh, after the, after that game, I, I don't even know how I got through the rest of the game. Cause I was so upset, but I was throwing my stuff off in disgust. And I was convinced I was not coming back to the, to the sport. I was, I was literally saying, this is it for me. And it was my senior partner who said to me, Rico, today's the day you either grow up or you stay a kid. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you're going to run across racists in your life, and they're going to try to disrupt your world. And if you allow that to happen each and every time and chase you out of this from being your own self and who you want to be, he said, you're, going to, you're, just, you're not going to be a happy person. And I was, I was kind of stunned, but he was absolutely right. So 35 years later, obviously, I didn't give up the stripes, but that was not the only time. In fact, I want to talk a little bit about the culture of hockey in the 90s when I was a player and refereed. I would find myself, and I look back now in disgust at myself, find myself joking first about being the only Black person in the locker room to ease tension because you could feel the awkwardness, uneasiness within some groups that I went in. And I often thought, as because then what would happen is once I made that joke clear, and then the next thing you know, the floodgates open up. Now they're telling me black jokes. And I would leave the ring thinking if my black friends knew that I was accepting this kind of stuff, they'd be wondering what the hell's wrong with Rico, right? They'd be questioning me. So it was, but I mean, things like my, my, my referee partners will come up to me and say, hey, Rico, don't forget the puck goes down. It's not jump ball. Constant references to go play basketball. Over time, though, as we fast forward through time, 
a lot of those occurrences have, have gone away. I can remember 20 years ago, a high school hockey player telling me to go back to the country I came from. I mean, these things have occurred and they continue to occur. Unfortunately, we still see them. But when we talk about the culture in the locker room overall, for some reason, and I'm working on this now through my role with the OHL, we believe that um, being uh, using microaggressions and other forms of communication that are demeaning and defaultful are okay. And I have told people this, that are in my age group, we're trying to figure out why is everybody so woke all of a sudden? And there was this sensitivity about it. And I'm gonna tell you as a kid who grew up in the seventies that was called an Oreo, because I'm actually biracial for many years, that it wasn't right then, but I had to accept it because that was a different time. That means it isn't right now. The difference is the evolution of time has meant so that today we're able to have these uncomfortable conversations that we could have had 30 years ago or more. Wow. Just like everyone else, Rico, you have given so much for us to, to take in. And uh, similarly to with the other panelists, there's just a few notes that I took of things that I'd, I'd, I'd love to reflect on. And the first is, uh, first, thank you for sharing. Um, I, I try to keep conversations. If, if I'm, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. When I speak to other melanated people, I keep the conversation and the questions as open as possible because it's actually something that is very conscious in my mind. And Becca mentioned it earlier, right? And I think you alluded to it just now the free and constant labor, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or the expectation that we are supposed to take those jokes, that we have to go into a locker room and almost make those jokes so that we essentially protect ourselves. Um, and, and I appreciated though, because you're, you're making me think honestly of times that I, I might've done that or maybe even continue to do that in how that plays into and, uh, and perpetuates the culture that you mentioned, the locker room culture, when it comes to at minimum microaggressions. And just, I'll do a little bit of a quick, I don't have like the Webster's dictionary version, but just for those who might not be familiar, these are um, little things that are like, uh, it's not calling someone the N word or using what is identified very squarely as, as a racial slur or something like that. But it's saying things like you said, remember the puck goes down and not up. It's using someone's background and culture and what is stereotypically associated with that um, in a way, uh, as you mentioned, as a joke or, or in the locker room in that sense. Um, but there's the residual from racism and sexism um, and other ways that we marginalize. Um, and, and you mentioned that you would do that to you know, ease the tension. Yeah, that's, that's heavy, Rico, you know, and I felt that I just, you know, I, I'm saying it again, because I almost just from my own mind and in processing need to reflect on how that made me feel, you know, um, that's very heavy. Um, but I also appreciate you honoring that it wasn't right back then. And that means it's still not right now. And the difference, and this is what Dr. Tanisha Singleton started us off with essentially, right? If we didn't know, if we make, if we have made mistakes, that's acceptable to the point that when we honor and identify those mistakes that we change them. So you said that that's something that you're looking to do in the Ontario Hockey League. So why don't we get into that? Um, okay. What are some of the ways that you are able to use uh, the personal experiences that you have and forge goodness in the sport that we all now love. We've all identified we are hockey lovers on this panel. So Rico, um, what has that pivot been like in this role for you? Well, and it's been an incredible pivot because um, as a state, I, I, I retired from the city of Flint fire department after 27 years. And uh, during my tenure in the fire department, I served many roles but the biggest thing about me was that I didn't just, um, as we like to say, put the wet stuff on the red stuff. I also was a big um, advocate uh, for community safety. I taught fire safety, but I was also part of our union, which I worked on many diversity projects before the word diversity was the word. But that's exactly what we're working on because men and women of all races and walks um, work together in the, in the fire department here in Flint. And we work 24-hour shifts, so we're actually 
you know, co cohabitating for 24 hours. So it's very important that you have, you know, the ability to have good relations. And when things go awry because of talking stuff, which happens all the time, especially uh, in a fire station. But anyways, going forward with that was able to do along with my hockey experience was um, it bridged this gap. So, so here's what happened. So I go to um, George Floyd's name came up more than once today. And it's very ironic. And um, I'm going to tell you this, that George Floyd did not die in vain because that was a moment in my life also when I wanted to stand up and scream from the highest mountains. What can I say? What can I do? And I was fortunate. Something, I don't know, I didn't plan it this way, but I called Willie O'Ree. I said, Willie, how you doing? We're in the middle of pandemic. How you doing? And we were talking and I told him, I said, man, I'm struggling because this thing with George Floyd, man. And he says, I said, I just don't know what to do, what to say. And he said, Rico, let me tell you something. Your voice is being heard in hockey and people are listening. So you better keep screaming. And so I, I just, out of the blue, decided I was going to contact um, David Branch, the commissioner of the Ontario Hockey League, who I'd met a few months earlier, and ask him what was happening with the league and diversity inclusion and ask him um, how I could help, if at all, because I had retired by that point. And it led to about six conversations and the creation of my position with me in mind. So I have this open blueprint, which is uh, which may seem good, but it's kind of difficult because I don't have a, a proven method. I have to reach out to others within uh, this space. So I'm glad to meet the other panelists. That's for sure. We'll probably be buddies after this. Um, but what I, the first task I had was to get a, uh, my finger on the pulse of the Ontario Hockey League from a cultural perspective. So what we what we did is we interviewed seven recent players of the Ontario Hockey League. They played within the last three to five years and they're all players of color, all BIPOC players from various ethnicities. And we asked them uh, standardized questions. And um, I, I gotta tell you some really good stuff came out but some, some alarming things came out of those conversations. One of them was that all of those players with exception of one, the first time they'd heard a racial taunt or slur was between the ages of eight and 11, and it was at an ice rink. And it was not any, I mean, I, I made sure I clarify where. It was everyone from uh, opponent, um, coach, teammate, and parents. So that was, uh, that was uh, eye-opening. I realized that when the kids get to the Ontario High League, they're 16 to 20 years old, if they have, if they believe this is part of the standardized culture, then we're never going to fix this situation. So I started working with minor hockey associations throughout Ontario because that's where the lion's share of the players come from. In lieu of that, I started working with the players themselves and had what I call courageous conversations with virtually all 20 teams. And Erica, I don't want to hold all, the, all of us all day here, but I'm going to tell you some very eye-opening things happened, some very great things happened in the sense that players were willing to open up. Some players that open up about issues they had as a person of color and others, white players were asking questions that they didn't know the answer to, you know, things about hip hop music and the use of the N word. But what I felt great about is that they felt comfortable enough to open up the conversation, the dialogue. And that's what I'm working on most right now. My second phase would be working with to create inclusivity above the players, which is most important long-term so that the league becomes stronger. Rico, again, thank you so much. And at this point, I, I want to bring in Becca and, and Jen once again. And, um, you know, Rico, you mentioned that, that great advice that Willie O'Ree gave you, that your voice is being heard. And, I mean, Willie would know, right? Because uh, you were given uh, the Willie O'Ree Award, that's named after yeah. him, of course, in 2019. Um, so you're doing great work in the community. And that includes within, as you mentioned, trying to now focus on hockey players and getting that information. And you, it sounds like you've been able to gain that trust and now yeah. moving that up. And so with both Jen and Becca, you are working for hockey organizations, but not on the ice as a referee, a coach, a player, et cetera. So there's a little bit of distance between um, what's happening on the ice and the, and the product and the roles that you play. But we had a question in the chat. Um, and I'll mention also that Rico, you are working with the Hockey Diversity Alliance, but the question yes. was, um, and I'm actually going to, I'll circle back to you on this, but, um, you know, Becca and Jen, when you hear that uh, marginalized players, players of color 
I should say uh, socially and systemically marginalized um, players um, and then players of color. When you hear that uh, they have come to create the Hockey Diversity Alliance and that they felt there was a need for the Hockey Diversity Alliance. Are there any things that resonate with you as to that, that formulation and creation that you could then use for the work that you respectively do? Um, Becca, with again, I mentioned the, uh, the app and innovative fan engagement, but then Jen also, you're working specifically with uh, diversity and inclusion in the, with the Maple Leafs. So Becca, we'll come to you first and then and go to you, Jen. Sure. So I think immediately in my sort of day-to-day -day responsibilities that are, are focused on the app, I think that uh, accessibility is a huge piece of what we're trying to build with the app. Uh, hockey games are expensive to attend. We are far from a lot of our fans. Uh, we even uh, want to just think about how we can make the sport itself more accessible for everyone um, to, to be part and engage with our organization. So um, for us, it was uh, lobbying the league really hard to allow us to put highlights in our app, which took us uh, two years, but we got permission, which was really exciting, um, which sounds really minor, but it's a huge thing of, of how can we actually have this be here for our fans right here in their hands. Uh, it's getting to know our players, to be able to understand the sport a little bit better. It's education on the game. It's access to more information about the team and what we're doing. But also, I think from a uh, less of what I do, but more on what I help with from the DEI side is uh, as far as our community is concerned and who we're reaching out to, where we built our headquarters, um, the three sheets of ice that we built uh, under our offices. One is obviously our practice rank. The other two are for the community. They're the first sheets of ice in the city of Seattle, I think since the 1960s. Um, and the neighborhood in which that is built is actually one that uh, has a severe lack of access to really sports overall for their kids. They don't have access to fields or, or play spaces. And so for us, we recognized immediately that as soon as we open, we need to be part of this immediate community where we are and recognize uh, the, the areas of the city that would benefit the most from us being here, uh, our players from the team, everything. Um, and so for us, I think it's it's multi-pronged, um, but from my day-to-day, -day, from, from the tech perspective, we want to use the app to help grow the love for the game and to help give access to anyone who wants to engage with us in any way. It's one of the beautiful things about social media, right? It gives you the ability to follow and care about teams that you, you want to engage with. Uh, and I think we think about the app as an even more direct path to that at, at, a, at a depth that maybe social media can't quite garner. Uh, the app can really be that for people. So that's how we think about that uh, day to day to help grow the game and and see that there. And I think, um, you know, with with the HGA and, and with that pushing the game forward, I, I don't, we're so excited to watch what they're doing and really follow their lead, um, but also make sure that we're implementing anything that's working in other communities here. If, if we see something that seems like it's really working abroad, but also to, because I think we have a little bit of an easier route because we're a brand new team, we're not taking as many risks with a fan base that's expecting something of us. We're getting to establish, this is who we are. If you don't like it, sorry. Um, we recognize that we have that freedom. And so uh, being able to, anything that seems innovative or crazy, we're kind of like, whatever, we'll see it. The risk is a lot lower for us. Uh, and I think that's, really with everything, but especially with uh, diversity and growing the game and being more inclusive as a, as a company. From my perspective, um, what I'll, I'll comment on is the need for representation in hockey and um, very much what has been advocated for by the HDA and, and other advocacy groups. So um, from the Leafs perspective, um, what we did this season is we introduced a new management and coaching development program. So this is a paid um, program. So we have um, two individuals um, and we made it clear that we were looking to hire people who are BIPOC or from a marginalized group, very deliberate with these actions. Um, and um, with that, we've been able to hire um, two black professionals, one in, in the management stream and, and one in the coaching stream. And um, what we've been able to clearly communicate and what is clear and how strong these, these candidates are is 
you know, historically, they might not have been given that chance. They maybe didn't have those strong networks within hockey that other white folks just have had the, the opportunity to have. So we've been able to be very deliberate with our actions there and, and start this development program. Um, and even, you know, we've only been able to hire two folks for that, but even, um, with the folks that made it to the final rounds of interview, just being able to help them unlock other opportunities within the, the sports spaces that as, as well. So understanding the, the representation and um, also what we're doing from a Leafs perspective too, is helping bridge the gap for um, black youth who are on the cusp of, of a draft year. So with the hockey equality program with, with Anson, Anthony Stewart, um, being able to use the likes of um, our, our Black Leafs players, um, Wayne, Wayne Simmons, for example, and Mark Frazier, who I work with at the Leafs, to use them as mentors to mentor these um, Black youth who are on, on the, the cusp of breaking into professional hockey. And um, we acknowledge, you know, the, the strong role that that mentors play in that. So using our, our platform and, and resources to, to support those youth. Yeah, I really appreciate you, uh, Jen, laying that out. You talked about representation and how much it matters, but then also creating, um, well, let me step back here because I think a lot of times when we have something that isn't the way we want, we rely on, or we kind of default to, well, you know, this is how it's always been. We've already hit on that a few times, but if we know that we don't want it to be how it's always been, then we have to make some changes. And so uh, things that you can do as far as when you are, uh, when it comes to hiring practices, I guess is what I'm saying is to create pathways, um, which is essentially what I hear you saying. And so paid internships and opportunities, mentorship opportunities are massive. But I also just want to direct everyone to the, the handout. I've mentioned it a few times, but it's worth repeating because even if we step outside of hockey, and again, going back to, for those who were at the beginning, my Gray's anatomy analogy, that was a lot. Um, you know, if we are wanting to change a system, but not looking hard at the practices that create the homogenous culture, then we are missing out. So Rico, I'm going to use that to come circle back around to you because we did have a question about the OHL in particular. You've talked about being able to have conversations, um, which is extremely important. And we hear about representation. We heard about Becca and accessibility. But at some point in time, and I'll speak for myself here, it kind of seems like these circles are spinning and they're well-to-do but they don't always touch or overlap mm -hmm. in ways that are concrete or even sustainable. Um, it, are there things that the OHL is thinking about and, and that you've been able to bring to that role? I know you, you talked about what has happened in the fire department, but can you give us a little bit more about that and, and maybe what you'd like to see in hockey overall? Yeah. Um, so one, one of the things I, we've done, should I say, is uh, created an equity, diversity and inclusion committee made up of, uh, a variety of folks uh, as a cross section. I was pretty proud <laughs> the fact how diverse that group was considering when I first got to the league, I'm trying to figure out who the BIPOC folks are that rep have representation, not just BIPOC, but we also have um, a member representing the LGBTQ plus community that works for one of the organizations. So these are all internal organization folks that uh, play some sort of a role. And what they're helping me do is create the metrics, so to speak. Um, so when we are asking these questions and we're going on the, and I'm doing these presentations, one of our first metrics that we're going to have, hopefully, that the occurrences of penalties for these types of things go down. The on ice activity is the first metrics we should be able to see that it's, I'm hoping it escapes. Because one of the things I'm trying to do is also go to games and make sure that I'm seeing that just through you know, our screen right here, which is how most of them have met me, but also go to games throughout the league and remind them just by being present, remind them how important it is to me and the league. Um, but the other thing is we're going to do some long-term metrics. We're going to look at, uh, we're kind of in the process of uh, revamping a policy that's, um, I don't want to call it antiquated, but it just needed, it needed a little bit more um, so that 
if you were the victim of a situation, you knew what the resources were, how to obtain them. If you were the by bystander of a situation, what to do, what the resources are. We wanted to make sure we expand it on and not just say, okay, this is what diversity and abuse and harassment is about. Don't do it, otherwise you'll get a penalty. And then that was it. So we want to make sure we re, uh, enhance it, I guess is the best way to put it, because I thought the policy was well written. Um, but with that said, that's um, the phases that we're at right now. And then long term from that is looking at how we can develop hiring matrix or metrics rather uh, matrix, for for a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for everybody to get a chance to. Um, so not everybody, but so that we look at broadcasting roles, we look at athletic trainers, equipment managers. Obviously, we can't necessarily say a GM, but yes, GMs and all the likes we have to in order for this to look right. And the way I see it is there's diversity that's happening in our sport. We can say it. We can see it across the landscape. Is it enough? Well, that's to be debated. I know it's not enough, but yes, we're working towards it. But where I see things stop is at the players level. So players in the OHL, they can't even see someone that they can aspire to be that looks like them if they're a BIPOC person. And that's what I'm trying to help change by, um, by encouraging the owners and the general managers to look at how we're hiring and looking for folks in their communities that aren't necessarily hockey people that can still do very well in this sport. And just like many of us, we just kind of hooked up into it and here we are, you know, making a difference. So that's what long-term goals are for us. I really appreciate you. Press the wrong button again. <laughs> I really appreciate you, Rico, bringing up um, metrics. And then, you know, Jennifer, earlier you talked about KPIs, which is uh, just for anyone who may not be familiar, a key performance indicator um, or indicators. Um, so for Jen and for Becca, and I know, again, in the resources that we have, you both touched on this a little bit, but can, can you take us back now to some of the things that akin to what Rico was saying that either your team, Toronto and Seattle respectively, is measuring when it comes to DEI or um, some programs that you think will help you get to some metrics where you can really um, be able to have, again, not that matrix or maybe a matrix, uh, but you can have those metrics to see if your team is on track uh, to what you hope to accomplish. So why don't we start with you, Jen, and then we'll go to Becca. Yeah, something that um, we're really focused on right now um, in, in the corporate space, um, so not just within the, the Maple Leafs, is upon our, our hiring practices. Um, we are in the midst of hiring many, many positions across um, all, all of our different um, departments at, at MLSC. So in terms of representation goals, we've, we've set those. We've set them out for for BIPOC uh, groups and for women as well. And those, those have been communicated through the executives, but the, the res and I saw this in, in the Q and A, um, there is a bit of resistance there. It's, it's change management. Um, you're coming out with, um, with goals that some people might feel um, are taking away from their opportunities, or they also feel that um, they might not um, know how to lead an interview inclusively. Um, and we know it's as important as it is to, yes, get, um, you know, people in the door for those interviews, but you're only going to be successful to hire them and onboard them and integrate them if you have inclusive leadership capabilities. So we're really approaching that from a education learning and, and development training perspective, being able to equip all of our, our hiring managers with the tools so that they can lead inclusively. Um, as a sports organization, we know that many people from, from marginalized groups might look at our uh, website and say, mm, that's maybe not the place that I wanna work. I, I don't see myself reflected in, in the MLSC that I see on the TV screen. So we need to be very, focused in the um, relationships that we have with external talent sourcing agencies, showing up at university and college job fairs, and not just the top tier universities that might get ranked uh, based upon, you know, the, the graduating GPAs, but 
local colleges and even rethinking how are we writing our job descriptions and who might that be excluding. So we're very much taking um, a foundational hands-on approach to all measures of, of hiring as we build our, our workforce coming out of the pandemic to be stronger together. And Becca, I'd love for you to chime in here because again, in the resources, you offered some things that I think are very parallel to what Jen was just saying, but if there are other things that you'd like to share, please do uh, regarding what Seattle is doing when it comes to those KPIs or metrics in relation to DEI and getting uncomfortable in the workplace. For sure. So um, we have uh, organization-wide goals that are actually tied to our bonuses, um, which is great, um, but they are company-wide. We obviously have individual team goals, whatnot, but this, these are company-wide and our, our DEI initiatives are company-wide. So they're held by all of us. And that includes staffing numbers of what we would like our female and BIPOC breakdown and, and is including dis disabled employees as well. We're really tracking all of those. Um, so as an organization, we are all invested in them for, uh, not only just our bonuses, but also because it's the right thing to do. Um, and it was an uncomfortable moment. I remember when we first unveiled that people felt it was almost a little bit crass um, to put sort of gold numbers around human beings and, and these, uh, these issues. But at the same time, if you're not tracking it and you're not, uh, and you don't have a goal that the entire company is, is rallying around, are you ever actually going to get there? And will you know if you're hitting those moments? You don't. Um, and so it was a really interesting conversation with all of us of, is this the right thing to do and why or why not? Um, and ultimately we decided it is the right thing to do. And this is something we should be really open about. And as a company, when all of a sudden our numbers have dropped a bunch and we've just hired a lot of like white men, let's talk about what well, we hired all of our hockey ops, right? Are those numbers all of a sudden were, were a little bit different, um, but we were hiring so fast over the past 18 months that to have that front of mind for us, top of mind for us as an organization, uh, I think really helped us continue to remember what we're trying to do here. Um, and, and we do have similar programs. We have um, the universities nearby, as well as some of our partner organizations with our foundation. We do have paid internships and scholarships that we're working with, especially with the sports business MBA program at some of our local universities here um, that we have rallied the other sports teams in the city to work with us. And we'll be taking on I think the number is at least 15 paid interns every summer from these various programs and then some also throughout the school year um, and to where we have also set goals for uh, those individuals being uh, BIPOC individuals or, or female candidates um, without really being part of the focus. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we understand that being a more inclusive team is good for business. Um, if you want to really be direct about this, um, it is. And we want to grow the fandom. And that's good for business. It's good for, for the game. Um, and so when we talk about it, we see this as a long-term investment in a sport that we love and treating people the way they deserve to be treated, but also pulling people in and welcoming them in versus leaning into the group that might be the loudest as far as you know, yelling at us on Twitter. We don't need to listen to those voices. We know that in the long term, doing the right thing and, and opening ourselves up as a team is great for us and the game and ultimately our community. Mm, that last piece is interesting because it it hits on what I think someone was alluding to in the comments and apologies for not getting to all of the questions, tried to remix as many of them as possible. But, you know, I think it was, you know, where does uh, the, the, or how can hockey as, the collective we, how can we take the feedback that we're getting from fans, but not rely solely on that feedback? Uh, to Becca, I think the point that you were making before change is enacted. And I think that brings us very much to present, unfortunately, with what's happening. And I will impart my opinion here. So I'm not putting this on any of the panelists or on Black or Hockey Club. But we see calls now for um, people to resign or to be fired or to, for their name to be taken off of things like the Stanley Cup. And while I don't want to argue that case right now, those things do not, without other steps, make it so that the next person is, first of all, not abused. Uh, but if they are, unfortunately, that they're believed and that they're supported. 
And it's going to take more than removing someone's name or removing them just from a job and then watching them get another job elsewhere, um, even when perhaps they're a talking head for the sport. So again, very much that was Erica, not anyone else, but I think it's worth mentioning that we have to take bold uh, moves. We have to make bold moves and we have to be real about what's happening. And unfortunately, um, the hockey space and a lot of under, other industries, I talked about the nonprofit industry at the top, we're not protecting the people uh, that we say we value, um, which are our players or our workers um, or the community members. And so I thank you all for sharing what you are doing though, to express that with new apps, you are engaging in fans and making accessibility a premier piece of that. I also loved Becca, what you shared about the bonuses because another note that I wrote down is essentially the Seattle Kraken said where the money reside, right? Okay, so when we get, when we focus on uh, measurement, that's how we know what matters. Uh, so I loved that. Jennifer also thinking about what Toronto is doing, again, about creating pathways. Unfortunately, a lot of the reason that we are able to, as a society, I would argue, accept that certain people don't play hockey or certain genders don't coach hockey is not because that's real. It's because what's seen. And that's also Rico, what you have been talking about from being in the community and being able to hear what people are saying and knowing firsthand that players, as much as they love this sport, as much as they go from athletic trainer <laughs> to referee, um, to director, that every step of the way for someone like yourself, or even quite honestly for me, it's questioning whether I belong here only because I haven't seen anyone else that looks like me. So I want to thank the panel at this time. We're going to do one more circuit before we bring in Dr. Singleton, but we'll start with you, Rico, then go to Becca and close out with Jen. Closing thoughts for those who are able to join us for this get uncomfortable in the workplace. Well, I think what's very important is that we understand that this, this is a transformation. People don't like to use the word change. So transformation takes time. But I think what's different about this, that the timing is now. And I think more people are much more keenly aware. In fact, when I'm talking to these teams and the coaches are, of course, on the cause, and I, I express to the coaches, coach, these young players in front of you are starting to understand that they have to be aware of what they say and why, why they say matters, different than our, our generations. So we need to give them, let their torch be a little brighter as we give them the tools that they need to be our, our next generation of leaders. So I think if we, we continue to work in the youngest of groups, and that means going all the way back, like I said, to minor hockey, and when you go back that far, you gotta go to parents and let them know that there's a standard and inside of every single ice rink that every parent brings their child to. I don't care what city, what where you're at. When that standard is held and met, then when they become young people, young men, young adults, then they're gonna be uh, poised to carry this and it'll become norm, hopefully. I mean, obviously we have pie in the sky, but I see over the last um, year and a half since I've been there, I already see some changes happening. So I guess I want everybody to leave this yeah, it's going to be a lot more uncomfortable conversations. I've got to um, have a, I'm going to Toronto uh, next weekend and I'm going to be speaking to the board of governors and, and, um, and owners. And I'm going to tell them what I've been doing, but it's going to be planting the seed, how we have to have more inclusive thinking from the top down. If they think this way, if they start to change the way that they do business, it's going to filter all the way to the bottom and the players will already know what to expect when they're here. So that's what's, um, I guess those are my closing thoughts in the sense that I want everybody to know we're going the right direction. Keep our heads up. And for me, I think what I'll say is in Seattle, I think we understand that we have a blank slate. And in a lot of ways that makes this easier for us as an organization. And um, launching a new franchise is really difficult for a myriad of reasons, but when it comes to making decisions that might feel risky uh, to a more established team, they feel less so for us. Um, so what we're trying to do and what I hope we are held accountable for is to show that we can lead from an inclusive space and we can establish a team 
that feels that way from the beginning and that that team can be successful. Because ultimately, I think at the origin of why this isn't happening more is fear and, and, and the risk that comes with making what feels like risky business changes. Um, and we're hoping that we can become in some ways an organization to emulate. Um, and if and when we are not doing that and we're not getting as uncomfortable as we can and, and doing um, better for our community, I think I would like our fans and I would like our community to hold us accountable, but we as an organization, and I can speak for myself, take it really seriously that we have this opportunity right now that isn't going to happen for us again uh, to help establish a team that is hopefully leading, leading in a lot of ways uh, through some of these changes to make it a little bit easier for everybody else. So for us, uh, we're hoping if we get a little bit uncomfortable because it might be a little bit easier for us um, that that can pay dividends for, for really our community, but for sports as a whole uh, moving forward. So really grateful for y'all being here and, and helping us uh, along the way, that's for sure. For my closing comment, um, all of us on the line today, we share a common goal to change the broader hockey ecosystem. So whether or not you work in hockey, you play hockey, Everyone has a platform and a voice and a toolkit that they can use as an ally uh, to stand up for people. Um, so what I've been challenging my colleagues is to take time to reflect upon what you're doing, not just as an ally, but as an active ally. And there's often a misalignment between what an ally thinks that they should be doing to support an equity seeking group and what that equity seeking group needs. So with that misalignment, we need to have those clear ch um, channels of communication um, to be able to bridge that gap. So then as allies, we're able to further the work um, to make a more inclusive and an equitable environment, but doing that in the way that people from equity seeking groups so desire. So my challenge is for everyone to have those uncomfortable conversations, get uncomfortable yourself, and together we can work together to make um, hockey more inclusive on and off the ice. Well, again, Becca, Jennifer, and Rico, thank you so much. Each one of you essentially telling us that the time is right now for many reasons, whether we're a new franchise, whether we've been in the game for 30 years, or whether our organization is just restructuring to take this on. The time is right now and together we can do it. But the right now, right now time is for me to send it back to Dr. Tanisha Singleton. No, I, I can't thank you all enough. This has been fantastic. And you've, everyone, Rico, Jennifer, Becca, you've moved so many of us. Um, I can tell in the chats and these private DMs and texts, and I've been watching the Twitter feeds and YouTubes as well. And so much perspective and you've just moved many of us to tears and in just silence as well to just listen. Cause I think that's, that's also just so key and so very important. And the idea of setting the tone, right? Setting the tone for what is tolerated and having to have putting pressure on leaders to actually lead, lead from the front, right? And recognize the leader in all of us, right? And in the team and that we all have value that we can add and that we can all be contributing towards the greater good and towards our collective goal, right? I wish we could just talk about hockey and stats and OV and all this stuff, you know? Like, I wish we could talk just about that stuff, but it's fun, but we can because a lot of us haven't, we don't have the permission to do so because we're humans first and we're people first and we all feel and we all are affected by these things. So the things that are going on organizationally and internally, it spews out. And so, yeah, it's, there is a standard and a level of intentionality that needs to be there. So I thank you, Rico, for echoing that as well. And in addition to, to you, Becca and Jennifer, because this stuff is just so it's so critical. Yeah. The time is now like, why, why, what, what do we have to wait for? You know? Um, and I just hope that everyone feels empowered to recognize that we all can contribute at all of our different levels and all of those different lanes. It's about controlling what we can control. Right. It's what I said in the open, like, what do we have access to? What are we privy to? What can I do? Do that self-work, do that audit of yourself, 
and see where you can contribute. Where do you have resources? It could be a job. It could be volunteering. It could be donating clothes. It could be reading and listening and shutting up for a change. It could be a lot of amalgamation of all of these different things. And in doing that, if everyone started to do that, that's when you can start to create this type of positive forest fire that maybe then can just eliminate the other fog and it, and the noise. I think that's how we have to cut through the noise is by, you know, taking this one person at a time and just starting to contribute and, and getting out there and doing the work, because that's what we all have to do that. We can't be lazy anymore that this is, you know, this is the result of laziness and not caring. It's like, oh, I'll deal with it later. Like, ah, I don't need to review this. I don't, this, I'm sure it's fine. Whenever it was written, I'm sure it talks about everybody. Like, not so much. That's not progress. That's being stagnant and ignorant. Those are two ugly words, my mom said. I think she's right. <laughs> um, so I want to thank you all again for making space to be here. I just want to give a couple of announcements, some extra things that Black Girl Hockey Club has coming up. We have our book club is coming back um, November 20th registration links to register will be in our bio on all of our social media channels and also going to our website so that i'm very very excited for this one because we are going to be reviewing game misconduct hockey's toxic culture and how to fix it by evan moore and javina shaw so and the forward i think was written by somebody who's affiliated with black girl hockey club i just a uh, couple folks that's yeah so make sure that you register and attend that book club we also are going back outside, which is exciting. Our first in-person meetup is going to be in Los Angeles when the Pittsburgh Penguins come in and play the Kings on January 13th. So make sure you're following us on social media. So if you want to join us in our meetup, um, you will certainly can do so. And Renee's doing the cool eyes because, you know, she's all pins and stuff. So uh, make sure you come and find us and meet up with us there and have some fun in person again. And then we are considering, we wanna do more of these because this is obviously is a conversation in the topic of you know getting uncomfortable and in the workplace, this is a conversation that obviously warrants some continuation and other dialogues and how to turn those insights into action. So if you are interested in having another event like this, holler at us, let us know. We're easy to find. Fire up the Google machine, blackrollhockeyclub.org, at Black Girl Hockey on Twitter. Find us on Instagram as well. Sign up for our newsletter so that you can get in touch with us and always get the latest information on these types of things because we're going to put this feeler out there. If this is um, something that you want us to even have at more of a private level for your team, your brand, your organization, um, let us know because we are here to curate all of these different types of resources and start to have these conversations because the time is now, we're not waiting for anybody else. We're gonna do the things ourselves that need to be done to serve the communities that we are accountable to. Um, so with that, I will let everybody go and enjoy the rest of your Saturday afternoons. Please have a happy and safe Halloween weekend. And we thank you again. We'll see you next time. <laughs>